Hello and welcome to the Construction Record Podcast. I'm digital mediator Warren Fry. February is Black History Month, and recently a Journal of Commerce staff writer Evan Saunders spoke with Nicole Dodd. She's one of the co-founders of the AB Anti-Racism EDU Committee, which campaigns for inclusion of Black History and Anti-Racism coursework in Alberta's K-12 curriculum. Nicole is also a service design lead at the Calgary Public Library, and as we'll hear in the interview, she's also a new mother, as her 10-month-old daughter has some things to say from time to time. Nicole and Evan talked about the legacy of Oliver Bowen, a black Canadian civil engineer with the city of Calgary, who became the architect of Calgary's sea train system in the mid-1960s. It was a monumental 144 million infrastructure project at the time, which continues to transport Calgarians around the city to this day. Bowen was born in 1942 in Amber Valley, one of several communities in Alberta settled by black people from Oklahoma, Texas, and other southern states in the early 1900s, looking to escape racial persecution. In this clip, Evan and Nicole discuss how growing up in that environment likely influenced Bowen's outlook. I was just uh, hoping maybe to start, you could tell me what you know about uh, Oliver Bowen's life. Yeah, so he is actually the descendant of black Albertans who uh, were from Amber Valley. Mm-hmm. And uh, I'm not sure if you're familiar with Amber Valley, but they <laughs> left racial persecution in uh, Oklahoma and came to Alberta to settle a new community called Amber Valley. Mm-hmm. And so he actually, um, his parents are from that community, and then he went to uh, the University of Alberta in 1965, and then moved to Calgary to work in the public transit department at the city of Calgary. Yeah, that's awesome. And and one of my questions, of course, because I was reading about Amber Valley this morning, was just to ask you, what what do you know about Amber Valley? Do you uh, do you have any? kind of good knowledge base of what it was like back then uh, living up there. I think they settled that in about 1910, right? Yeah, about 1910. So what I know about it is that it was basically self-contained community. Mm -hmm. um, And the black Albertans settled in that area um, largely because they essentially wanted to, I think it was out of partially kind of like exclusion and partially Mm -hmm. wanting to like have a community that was 100% their own. So they Mm -hmm. had their own uh, grocery store, they had their own mailman, they had their own school, um, everything completely self-contained within Amber Valley. Um, one of the sad things about Amber Valley is that over time, after the first generation had sort of set everything up, there wasn't enough economic activity to maintain the community, and mm. so now it's no longer, like, nobody really lives there anymore. It's just, it's kind of like a historical ghost town. Hmm. And and I was looking at it, and it's I mean, uh, about 400 kilometers north of Calgary, I think, north of north of Edmonton, definitely north of Edmonton, yeah. definitely way up there in terms of in terms of geography. Do you think do you yeah. think growing up in a community like that, where you know, it's as you said, it was self contained, primarily Black Albertan community. What kind of impact do you think that had on on Oliver Bowen to kind of I, I imagine to have a, a bit more in a way, I'm trying to find the right word here, but to, to be to be with black people and maybe not have to deal with some of the more institutional racism, so to speak, that some people might have experienced in more southern cities? Yeah, I, I don't really have it from that perspective. But yeah, you're right. I think like on a day-to-day basis, there would have definitely been less, obviously, would have been less um, emotional energy applied to dealing with racist encounters Mm -hmm. so i think there's that piece of it that would have built likely built up oliver bowen's self-confidence and built up his ability to um you know see himself as a black male in a black community where everything all your services are provided by people who look like you so there's a definite benefit to um that kind of uh community because then you and all the leadership looks like you, and that and that can only help you to because what what we always say is like you can't be what you can't see. Yeah. So if yeah. all the leaders in his community looked like him, that means that he had the ability to actually project and be like, oh well, if everyone looks like me and they're doing all these things, then that means that I could become any of these things and more. Exactly. That's kind of what I was thinking. I think you know, I it's something that's I think important to talk about is. You know, that's the world that we're still trying to build today. And, of course, being able yeah. to being able to see that and, and know from a childhood, say, I, I can do that role. I, I was in a community yeah. where people did that job, where people were doing civil work, were doing all those kinds of things. Precisely, precisely. And even if they didn't necessarily have the qualifications, 
they definitely were engaging in that type of work because Amber Valley would have had to have roads. Yeah. It would have had to have uh, all of the infrastructure necessary in order for it to function as a, as a community, as a village. Mm-hmm. So for sure, um, he would have seen that enacted and led by people who look like him. So that would have likely um, encouraged him to seek that higher education in civil engineering. Awesome. And I know that kind of also ties into, because I was doing a little bit of reading uh, about your anti-black racism and the kind of education uh, system that you're bringing into or that you did bring into K through 12 in Alberta. It's that same thing, right? Ensuring these stories are told so that young black Canadians can see themselves in these roles. Exactly. And I think it's more than just uh, young black Canadians. I think it's racialized people as a whole yeah. um, being able to themselves in those roles and I think it's also a benefit to um, Caucasian children as well because then they normalize all types of different looking types of people holding all the roles in society so I think for everyone it, it's only a benefit in this next clip Nicole explains what it was like for black Canadians like Oliver Bowen to make their mark in a professional capacity in Calgary in the 1960s 70s and 80s what were the 1970s like for a uh, black Canadian, black Albertan growing up in a city like Calgary or, or trying to carve a professional life for themselves out in a city like Calgary? When Oliver Bowen would have been doing it? I, I believe he was, uh, you said 1965, yeah. he graduated and he started kind of climbing the ranks through the 60s and 70s? Yeah. yeah. So I imagine, I mean, I can only extrapolate because I yeah. obviously live um, and there's not a lot of documentation that kind of highlights this time frame in Calgary um, mm-hmm. from a black perspective. But I can extrapolate from my mom's experience that she told me about being a young a professional in Calgary in the 80s. Mm-hmm. She said you would take the train, uh, you know, the train that Oliver Bowen made <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> or signed and, and, and facilitated. She said you would take the train into downtown and there would literally be nobody that looked like you. Like you get off the train, you walk to your building, your your office downtown, and you see like there's zero people that look like you. Mm-hmm. So I can so if you look back into Oliver Bowen's time, he for sure stood out, and mm-hmm. especially in his role, he would have definitely stood out. Um, and that that would have come with positives and negatives. So the positive aspect is that everyone would remember who he was. People would find him noteworthy. People would probably refer to him as like, oh, I know this black engineer. Yeah. But there's also the negative element where, um, you know, because you stand out, then you can attract negative attention, negative racist attention. Mm-hmm. So it's possible that he experienced microaggressions at work. It's possible he experienced just at flagrant racist discrimination in the office. Um, and that he would have had to just kind of roll with that and and move beyond that to get his job done. Absolutely. So, what do you think that says about his character that he was able to shoulder both those loads, so to speak, the job and the kind of social issues at the time and strive ahead? Well, I think um, somebody like him likely would have understood the, 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 the heaviness that comes with that because not only do you, in those kind of settings, would he have had to represent himself and everyone that comes behind him that looks like him. Mm-hmm. So there's a there's a strong sense of pressure. So it's likely he was a very high performer because in order for him to ensure that he's not the last black engineer that the city of Cal- Calgary hires, he needs to do an above average job. He needs to do an excellent job in order for him to ensure that he leaves that door open to all the black engineers who want to come behind him. So I think that that would be one part that Mm. I can imagine Mm -hmm. he carried. The other element would be that he was probably very resilient and probably Mm -hmm. didn't um, allow for people's comments or people underestimating him to define how he viewed himself and the type of work that he did. And in this clip, Nicole looks at the impact Bowen's leadership and engineering skill has had on the city of Calgary. He needed to do an above average job. You said he did more than above average job and he oversaw, yeah. <laughs> he, he oversaw every aspect of the largest infrastructure project in the city's history up to that time and still one of the largest ones as far as I know with inflation compared to the green line. I'm sure it's still right up neck and neck with it. What do you know about his work on the sea line? 
Um, so I know it was a hundred and forty four million dollar project that had a five year timeline. Mm-hmm. And Bowen was able to finish early and under budget, which was considered completely unexpected and just incredible mm-hmm. at the time and still is, right? We know yeah. uh, infrastructural projects can tend to go over budget and, and, and miss their, their timeline. So that, that's something that just demonstrates kind of what I had said before is that he probably felt that pressure to really stick to and, and go beyond what the expectations were for him in that role. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, he was able to essentially connect the city. Like yeah. that project, that C train line, it, it allowed for the ele- parts of the city that were previously kind of floating islands to now be interconnected through the sea train. So in that way, he's had his his um, impact on the city of Calgary it cannot be underestimated yeah. or under understated. I think I you know I think when you're thinking about you know when you when you talk about Canada and you know building the Pacific National Railway was kind of a thing that enabled the country to really kind of come together. The sea line was the yeah. same thing for Calgary. Yeah, 100%. 100%. Yeah. Finally, Nicole emphasizes how important it is to continue to tell Bowen's story, as well as raising awareness through education of the accomplishments of racialized Canadians throughout the nation's history. I know it's a pretty, it's a pretty big question, but always important to ask these kinds of questions. Why is it important to remember figures like Oliver and ensure that their stories keep getting told? Um, I think it's important to remember people like Oliver because it demonstrates that Canada has been built by people of all backgrounds Mm -hmm. and that Canadian cities, you know, historically and moving forward are places of significant diversity and significant um, difference, right? There's people are People, immigrants and you know, people like Oliver Bourne who were born in um, Alberta, mm-hmm. will, are, are, but who are also black and have that and hold that identity, make up the richness of Canadian society. And I think sometimes um, if we don't recognize this history. We tend to think that only white people built Canada or only white people are at the center of every important story in mm-hmm. Canadian history when that just like simply is not the case. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And as you were saying earlier, you know, to, to, uh, yeah, to ensure that across all spectrums, we understand that that is the story of Canada and normalize that. Normalize. And it's also like not, it should, like, I think some of the things that I found interesting about Oliver Bowen's story is that I was so surprised that this had never been t- like taught to me in school or no one's ever talked about this. Yeah. Like, as a person who grew up in Calgary, as somebody who has taken the C train more times than I can ever count, yeah. how was I not aware of the fact that a black man designed that whole that whole system? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and so I think that that shock, the, the the hope is that over time there's less and less of that shock. There's less and less of that. Oh my gosh, that's who designed that. Oh my gosh, that's who built that. Oh my gosh, that's who's behind that. My goal is that by the time my daughter is my age, that she's not surprised by those things. A black engineer is not a surprise to her. A black person being behind something crucial and important for a large city like Calgary is not a big deal. That's mm-hmm. that's the hope, is that we normalize mm-hmm. it and that we create a world in which nobody is, is uh, expects less of people just because they're racialized. Absolutely. Very well said. And that kind of leads into one of my later questions, which is, could you just tell me a little bit about some of the work that you've done in terms of working with Alberta's education sector with uh, black history and anti-racism um, education? Yeah. So a lot of our work has uh, been around advocating to the Alberta government for comprehensive um, anti-racism and black Canadian history in the curriculum. Mm-hmm. And like that has been kind of an ongoing process with many other partners and people who are also interested in having more of that type of content in the curriculum. But in addition to that, um, we've also like the, the types of posts that you've seen on AB Anti-Racism EDU have also been used by teachers to create lessons in the classroom. So kind of an unexpected outcome of our work has been that teachers have engaged with us significantly mm. and said, you know, while we wait for this to move along nice. the, the kind of formal legislative mm-hmm. path, let's do it what we can in the classroom right now 
and use these lessons as things that we can start teaching um, black history, robust black history today. That's it for this episode of the Construction Record Podcast. We're including a link to Evan's story about Oliver Bowen in the show notes, and you can listen to previous episodes of the Construction Record on Apple Music, Amazon Music, and Spotify, and at the Daily Commercial News and Journal of Commerce websites. Thanks for listening.